Welcome to Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute, hosted by Georgina Downer. September the 3rd is Australian National Flag Day, the day in 1901 when the Australian flag was first flown. But the flag as we know it today wasn't in common use until the 1950s when Menzies brought in the Flags Act. Over the years, its use and appropriateness as a national symbol has not been without controversy and even today we are now increasingly seeing three flags flown at official buildings rather than just the traditional blue ensign. Joining me to discuss the Australian flag is Alan Pigeon, who is Chair of the Australian Flag Association. Welcome to Afternoon Light, Alan. Nice to be here. Thanks, Georgina. It's wonderful to have you here, Alan, and this is such a fascinating topic and I was thinking about the flag as I was preparing for it and how in my lifetime there have actually been huge debates, but it seems to have calmed down lately, although perhaps there will be a resurgence of the debate given all the issues around the referendum that's coming up. But the flag as a concept, where did it come from, this sort of idea of a flag got in quite a deep, dark, interesting history, doesn't it? Well, I think probably the genesis was to identify your friends and your enemies, and particularly in war, to have some symbol or emblem that could identify which was which. Yeah, that sense that it is linked to warring armies is very integral, isn't it, to the history of the flag. The first flags were noted in China and in India. And then it wasn't, I think, until the Middle Ages that you saw flags coming about in Europe. And of course, you see those religious elements in flags, particularly in Europe. And the one, of course, we're very familiar with in Australia is the English flag and the British flag, the English flag having the St. George's Cross and then the Union Jack, the British flag, having not just the St. George's Cross but then the St. Andrew's Cross and St. Patrick's Cross from Scotland and Ireland. So those religious elements and really drawing on those connections of history and culture that develop the colours and the symbols that we're all really quite familiar with but probably don't think too much about, do we? No, we sort of take it as a given, but it is very interesting to look at the history. I'd have to say very few Australians know the story of our flag. No, indeed. The story of our flag is quite unique, isn't it, in the world? So let's start with that story of the Australian flag. How did we end up with the flag that we know and love today? Well, around the time of Federation, there was huge interest in the formation of the new Commonwealth for the new century. And even before Federation, the authorities were being bombarded with would-be flag designs from people who wanted to have their two bobs worth about what the national emblem should be. And there was a couple of enterprising media organisations that ran competitions. One was a Melbourne newspaper that actually announced a winner, which was more akin to the American flag because it had the Union Jack with stripes as well. So a design that didn't really see the light of day after that competition. But then the Review of Reviews magazine, a bit of a (laughs) mouthful, set up a more prestigious competition. They also said that whereas the previous Melbourne Herald competition had required that the Union Jack be included in all entries, They said they didn't want to fetter the entrance with that sort of limitation. And so they said that entries could be whichever form. They didn't have to include a Union Jack. And they announced a substantial cash prize, but also managed to secure the services of the state premiers to be judges. So that gave it a bit of status. And that probably prompted the Commonwealth to think, well, we've got all these unofficial competitions running. We'd better work out how we're going to have the official selection of a flag. And so in the Australian ethos of have a go, the Commonwealth Government decided it would run an official flag competition. And so Government Gazette in April 1901, one of the early instruments of the new Commonwealth Government, 
announced a flag design competition. And similarly to the review of reviews competition, that's a bit of a mouthful, there was no limitation on designs. So there was no requirement that a Union Jack be included. There was a bit of confusion because the earlier unofficial competition of the Melbourne newspaper had included that requirement. And the other thing was that the review of reviews said that the entries submitted for their competition would be automatically entered in the official Commonwealth competition so that it augmented the entries because there was a fairly tight time frame for the official competition. It was announced in April and closed fairly shortly, a month or so later. Right, but that was because quick. there had already been all this popular interest in thinking of designs. In the end, the official competition had entries, nearly 33,000 entries, which was about 1% of the Australian population at That's the time. That's amazing, isn't it? It is amazing. It's, it's hugely a huge, popular. a huge yeah. amount of interest in having a chance to design the flag. It was the world's first ever flag design competition. And so not only the patriotic frenzy of federation, but also the inducement of fairly hefty prize money because the Commonwealth funds of prizes were matched by a couple of enterprising commercial enterprises. So in the end, there was a prize pool, official and unofficial, that totaled £200, which was a very tidy sum in those days. But 33,000 entries, a lot of entries. And as I say, when I'm talking to schools, to enter the competition took a lot more effort than just to click like. You had to (laughs) submit your design and put it in an anonymous envelope because all the entries were anonymous. And there was also a search for a flag for official and national purposes and also a separate flag for the Merchant Navy. So there were two designs that were sought. Wow. And what were the designs that were submitted? What were some of the notable ones? We obviously know the winner. Yes. <laughs> we well, unfortunately, the designs were unsuccessful, were either returned to the entrant or destroyed. But we do have some photographs of the Royal Exhibition Building in Melbourne, which is where the 33,000 entries were displayed. <gasps> it took eight weeks wow. to sort them. And the selections were varied in size from a postage stamp to a huge banner. So it was rather challenging. But (laughs) one book I read said that the entries described included every aspect of Australian flora and fauna, sometimes all at once. (laughs) There were some pretty weird and wonderful ones. There was a kangaroo with six tails. One tail was meant to be for each of the founding states. Nice, yes. There were native animals playing cricket with a winged cricket ball, which would have been very helpful at Old Trafford, I'm sure. It's sort of, uh, that's resonant of uh, Quidditch and Harry Potter, isn't it? (laughs) It was ahead of its time. Maybe (laughs) J.K. Rowling saw that. Yeah, indeed. Uh, And then the one that really had me intrigued, which I can't find a representation of, is described as a kangaroo firing a shotgun through the stars of the Southern Cross. Mm. So that could have been our flag. (laughs) But obviously native fauna was really captivating the population at the time, that they thought it was really symbolic of Australia and deserved to be recognised in the national flag. Yes, I suppose the more bizarre ones are the ones that did attract attention and were recorded. I think the majority were probably more sober, but yeah, everybody really did let their imagination run riot, I think. They sure did. And I love the range of sizes that were submitted. You said some were postage stamps. I could read here one was 60 square metres of bunting. Yes. (laughs) Can you imagine? (laughs) And it was quite wise that they required that the entries be anonymous because there was a rumour that one state governor had submitted an entry, but obviously there was no favouritism because nobody knew (laughs) who had submitted which entry. Really? Really though? Well, when you see the outcome, you'll see that (laughs) there wasn't any favouritism. So there were... Five winners selected, weren't there? Because they all really submitted largely the same thing, didn't they? Indeed. Do you know the winners? Can you yes. can you list them off? Have you I, committed I can. them to memory? <laughs> and in fact, the original, as I said, the review of reviews, the unofficial competition had asked the state premiers to be the judging panel. However, very wisely, the Commonwealth had a different selection panel that included not only naval authorities, because as we've said, the Flag identifying ships at sea is a very important thing, so naval and admiralty had a lot to do with flags, but also people who are experts on heraldry and, importantly, someone who actually had an insight into manufacture because he wanted to make sure that the flag was something that could be manufactured and recognised easily and what have you. Yes. And so those judges considered all the nearly 33,000 entries 
And the winning design, they found that there were five people who tied because they had essentially the same concept. And the best known of the five was a 14-year-old schoolboy called Ivor Evans. And in fact, not that far from this building in Elizabeth Street is the old premises of Evan Evans, which was his family's flag-making business. Oh, so right. he did have a bit of an edge. Yes. But he, as I say, because of his age and whatever, was the best known. If anybody's heard of the competition, Ivor Evans is perhaps the only name they may have heard. <laughs> when I said that the entries were anonymous, you can see that the people who won would not be the ones who would normally be preferred by governments because there was a female winner, Annie Dorrington, who was a well-known watercolourist from Perth and many of her watercolours are in the Art Gallery of Western Australia. There was another teenager who was one of the Forgotten Five, Leslie Hawkins, who was an apprentice of a Sydney optician. And uh, William Stevens was a naval officer with the Union Steamship Company of New Zealand. And then the fifth winner was Egbert Nuttall, another young person, an engineer with Melbourne Metropolitan Board of Works. Who I know it was from Paran in Victoria. I used to live in Paran, so... There you go. <laughs> so the five winners were selected and the prize money was divided. And then what happened? Well, on the 3rd of September was when the announcement was made at the Royal Exhibition Building. A flag had been made that represented the winning design and the wife of the Governor-General of the day, the Countess of Hopeton, presided with the first Prime Minister, Edmund Barton. And at that stage, the envelopes were opened and the winners were revealed and they had their moment of glory, which was fairly short-lived because they did not really get the recognition that they deserve, we believe. Oh, that's a shame. Why was that? I think in the fervour of the early days of Federation, there were so many things happening. The new Commonwealth was moving at great speed, establishing all the national institutions, etc. And the novelty of the flag and the flag design competition perhaps didn't last the five did share in the prize money, so that was acknowledgement. But we think in other countries, the story of the world's first ever flag design competition would be part of national folklore and everyone would know it. In Australia, hardly anyone knows that. And also the names of the five flag designers, the people who tied as winners of the competition would be household names, but they're not at all known here, unfortunately. Well, I, I remember either. Evans and Annie Dorrington. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> and Mr. Nuttall from Paran. <laughs> so, yes. so the flag's chosen what's called the blue ensign. So it's the blue version of the Australian flag. But the red ensign, the red version, was also selected for shipping, wasn't for it? Merchant Navy. Yes. Yes, as I said, the competition asked for two flags, one for official and Commonwealth use, which was the Australian flag as we know it and one for the Merchant Navy, which is we know as the Red Ensign. And so in the years after 1901, once the flag was chosen and the winners of the competition swiftly forgotten, sadly, what happened? Because it wasn't like everyone just suddenly adopted this flag, did they? It was a bit confused, wasn't well, it? Well, in the early days, the view was that because the flag had been adopted for official purposes, the Commonwealth was the only body that was entitled to fly it. And the Commonwealth government persisted with that view for quite some time, even though in the early 1900s, there was a parliamentary resolution that the Australian flag should be flown at all defence establishments of Australia, etc. The view was that it was reserved for official use and individuals who wanted to fly an Australian flag, and particularly during the First World War, when patriotic spirit was more prevalent, took to sometimes flying the Red Ensign and the Merchant Navy flag on land because they said, well, we're not entitled to fly the official Australian flag. And there's a little bit of a history of that. For example, India, until very recently, reserved its flag for official use. And it was only when an individual citizen mounted a campaign in the last 10 or 20 years that the Indian government relented and said, okay, no, it's okay for private citizens to fly the Indian flag as well. So there was this view that the flag had a status and it was the property of the Commonwealth and that saw people who wanted to be patriotic flying the Red Ensign instead of the Australian national flag. 
So there was an element of confusion in the population, but then it was obviously an understandable one given what was happening in other countries, but also the sort of messaging maybe that was slightly mixed out of the official communications. But we should actually just look at the flag itself. I mean, what is the meaning of the symbols on the flag? Because I think they were obviously selected at that time in 1901 because they had deep meaning and they still have deep meaning. But while the Union Jack is on the flag and that represents obviously the historical ties to Britain and cultural ties to Britain as well. But the flag is our Australian flag and there are distinctly Australian things on that flag, aren't there? Indeed. And the original selection panel gave a report about their selection and they said that the great majority of entries did include a Union Jack and they saw that as appropriate given our status within what was then the British Empire. The Southern Cross is significant because obviously it's a constellation that can only be seen in the Southern Hemisphere and that sort of shows our place in the world, if you like. And in fact, Ivor Evans in his entry quoted Dante about the virtues that were supposedly encaptured by the stars of the Southern Cross. I don't know that a 14-year-old schoolboy today would be quoting Dante perhaps. Unlikely, um, but you know, you and, never know. And then you have <laughs> More precocious ones, mate. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have the Commonwealth Star or the Federation Star. And in the original design, it had six points for the founding states and then 1908 a seventh point was added because we'd acquired the territory of Papua in New Guinea and also it was understood that there would be the northern and other territories, ACT, etc. So the seventh point is for the territories. And that then gives us, of course, the flag as we all recognise it today. How many other countries have the Union Jack on the flag? Because that's quite interesting, isn't it? Fewer now than used to, obviously New Zealand does, and a number of current members of the British Commonwealth still do. I haven't done a tally, but I suppose the Union Jack acknowledges that European settlement in Australia came from Great Britain and that our system of government, our national language, the rule of law, etc., are all part of that heritage. So we say that acknowledges that part of our history. The Southern Cross has a very great significance in Aboriginal mythology and so it is a symbol that is present in a lot of Aboriginal legends and so we say that's also acknowledging that part of our history. The Federation Star or the Commonwealth Star is the future where we're headed as a Commonwealth together. So after the flag is announced and made official, you said it starts to be used but in fits and starts. I mean, we're seeing it used in World War I Indeed. in battles. But I note that in 1931, for example, it was actually the Union Jack that was draped over the coffin of Sir John Monash, the famous general. So there was still a bit of selection over which flag people were using for official ceremonies. Well, there was one official national flag when we know it, is the Australian flag today. For other purposes, people weren't sure whether they were entitled to use or fly that flag. Interesting about Sir John Monash, we have a photo of an Australian national flag that he decreed should be flown over his headquarters in the battlefields in France during World War I. We have a picture of the Australian flag, I think it probably first outing overseas over the grave of Breaker Morant in South Africa in 1902. So yes, there's quite a variety of representations of the flag, but private citizens were unsure that they had the right to fly the Australian flag themselves. But in these military campaigns, you do start to see the Australian flag being flown. I think it was flown, wasn't it? Was it Fort Nepean as the German ship was uh, escaping Port Phillip Bay in, was that in World War One? At the very start of At the war. At the very yeah. start of World War One. So you're, you know, so 1914. So you're certainly seeing its early adoption there in military campaigns. And Banjo Patterson wrote a poem, Hawker the Standard Bearer, about seeing the Australian flag in battle. Oh, really? Mm. Okay. But fast forward to the 1950s and Robert Menzies is once again Prime Minister from 1949 and there becomes a need for, he feels, the Flags Act. Can you tell me how that came about? Right. Well, as we said, there had been some confusion about whether 
private individuals were entitled to fly the Australian flag, the Australian national flag as we know it. And I came across an item in the archives, I believe it dates to 1939, just before Menzies' first term as Prime Minister, which was talking about the Australian flag. And it said the existing procedure regarding the type of Australian to be flown is set out in the statement attached, which was first issued in 1924. It will be observed that the use of the blue ensign, as they call the Australian flag, is restricted to Commonwealth government buildings and establishments, that the state flag is flown on state government buildings, and that the red ensign is the flag to be flown by the public generally. So that was just before Menzies took office as Prime Minister the first time. And very significantly, only two years after that, he issued a press statement, March 1941, saying the official view is that there should be no unnecessary restriction placed on the flying of the blue ensign on shore. Its use on public buildings by schools and by the public generally would not only be permitted but appreciated, provided it is flown in a manner appropriate to the use of a national emblem. Australian merchant vessels will, of course, continue to fly the Commonwealth Red Ensign So that was Menzies giving the seal of approval for the Australian flag to be flown by Australians. And that was quite a breakthrough and a complete reversal of the previous government policy from 1939 or preceding decades. So he had a history of encouraging the Australian flag to be flown by Australians. And it was only a few years later that Prime Minister Chifley, 1947, issued a statement in similar terms saying... For many years, the Commonwealth Blue Ensign was reserved for use on vessels of the Royal Australian Navy and on Commonwealth government buildings. There is, however, no restriction on the flying of the Commonwealth Blue Ensign on shore. So to reinforce that, it was decided that there should be an Act of Parliament confirming the national flag and also the Red Ensign as the Merchant Naval flag, outlining the official specifications for it and the other necessary legislative framework for flying a national flag. So the Flags Act itself is pretty mechanical. It sort of says this is the design, these are the dimensions, it should be flown in these circumstances and those types of sort of mechanics. It doesn't go into too much detail and in fact in introducing it into the House of Representatives in November 1953, Menzies said the Flag Act is very largely a formal measure which puts into legislative form what has become almost the established practice in Australia. And so the bill will set out legislatively something that represents common practice and a common view in our community. And he said the Flags Act was needed because no legislative action has ever been taken to determine the precise form of the flag or the circumstances of its use. So it was seen as declaratory, confirmatory. And the way we describe it is the flag's birthday September 3, 1901 was the first day the flag was flown when it was flown over the Royal Exhibition Building in Melbourne. The birth certificate was issued in 1903 when the official Commonwealth Gazette confirmed the approval of the flag for that purpose. And then, if you like, the flag came of age with the Flags Act with its passage in 1953. I see, I see. But it does make it confusing, doesn't it? I think a quick reading of that history, you might suddenly think, oh, well, the flag wasn't really the flag until 54. Yes, that is an understanding that some people have. We can test that because obviously the competition said that it was a competition for a flag for Australia. It was to be used for official purposes. The Commonwealth said it's our flag, we fly it, but it was regarded as the flag of Australia In the intervening decades, it had been flown in all sorts of places in Antarctica, at Commonwealth Games, in situations of war. Australian citizens had been keen to fly it so that it had become cemented as the national symbol. And to say that Australia didn't have a flag until the Flags Act in 1953 is confusing because on the same logic you would say that the Union Jack is not the official flag of the UK because there is no Flags Act in the UK. In fact, some years ago, a British MP tried to introduce a Flags Act just to do the same thing, to confirm the status of the Union Jack and prescribe the dimensions of it, etc. 
and that was a private member's bill it wasn't proceeded with, but obviously the feeling was that perhaps Britain needed a Flags Act <laughs> to officially confirm. Just to clear things up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> In early 1950s, of course, communism is a massive issue in Australia. We're in the beginnings of the Cold War and you know, that symbol of communism is red, right? Red's under the bed. There seems to have been a myth that the reason why Robert Menzies introduced the Flags Act to really solidify the position of the blue ensign as the Australian flag was because he wanted to put paid to this sort of red ensign flag that it might be seen as some kind of subliminal communist symbol within Australia. What do you say to that myth? (laughs) Well, exactly that it is a myth. It has no (laughs) credence. And there are two things that are claimed about the Flags Act. The first is that Australia didn't have a flag until the Flags Act. And as I said, it was officially gazetted in 1903, if that gave it official status. It was used by the Commonwealth as a symbol of the nation. And it was the Australian flag as we know it. Further, the other assertion is, as you said, that the Flags Act was because somehow Menzies took it in his mind to magically transform the flag from red to blue with the Flags Act. But the quotes I gave about when the Flag Act was debated in the Commonwealth Parliament show that it was just described as confirmatory in declaring what was existing practice. There was no change. The Australian national flag was the flag that we know as the Australian flag today and the Red Ensign was confirmed as the flag for the Merchant Navy. So that is a myth that is a little pervasive in some quarters. Unfortunately, it it found its way into a few history books, and so it's hard to nip in the bud. The other myth that is used when people are talking about the flag is that the official flag design competition in 1901 had a requirement that the Union Jack be included, but that was not the case, as we've discussed previously. Well, at the Robert Menzies Institute, we love to bust myths, so thank you for clearing those things up, Alan. Just to reflect on that period, though, I mean, was there ever any sense that it was more a Victorian flag than a New South Wales flag? Because the Blue Ensign, it does resemble what was the Victorian flag created after the Anti-Transportation League campaign, much more so than it resembled, say, the New South Wales flag. And I mean, in that period of Federation, of course, those relationships were hotly contested and who was preeminent and had more of a say over the direction of the country. Indeed, it was suggested that some politicians of the time regarded the new Australian national flag as too close to the Victorian flag. And in fact, Edmund Barton did submit a rival design for consideration by the authorities, as well as the official flag winning design from the competition. And that was given short thrift. It was said, look, we've had a competition the winner was announced and that's the yeah. one that will be the Need Australian flag. Yeah. And the Admiralty in London at that stage was sort of a clearinghouse for world flags. It was regarded as the leading authority on naval and other matters. And so flags being very important for recognising ships at sea, all sorts of countries, not only Commonwealth countries, submitted flags to be entered in the Admiralty's registry so that everyone would know which flag was which. And in 1908, when the change of the number of points on the Commonwealth Star was submitted to the Admiralty authorities in the same issue of the flags book. Flags from China, Russia and Japan were approved. So the Admiralty did have a worldwide registry, if you like, of flags. And does that continue to this day? I don't think in the same way, no. Britannia doesn't rule the waves anymore, I don't think. No, 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 it hasn't for a few years, has it? But I wonder where all the flags are lodged. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Maybe the United Nations. It's a bit of research for us after this podcast. So w- when the Flags Act was introduced, obviously the Menzies government was in favour of it and spoke in favour of it. Was there any controversy around that or was it just sailed through and that was that? It sailed through with unanimous support. Yeah. And in fact, the Labor leading identities, Everett and Corwell, were not only complimentary of the flag and saying that it was a good thing we had a Flags Act, but we're asking the Commonwealth to adopt rules similar to the US code as to how a flag should be used and what the protocols were and all that sort of thing. So 
they were very much in favour of it. And this was in relation to the respect accorded to the flag, that if it's damaged or there's some sort of attack on it, that there would be some offence that would be committed. Indeed. Yeah. And then opposition leader Dr Evatt said, we support this bill, the passing of a statute which defines and describes the Australian national flag is an important event. The flag that is now Australia's national flag based on the Blue Ensign is a very beautiful flag. It is probably the most beautiful flag in the world. Yes, that's quite emotive, isn't it, of Doc Evatt? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so what I find lovely about this story of the Flags Act is that it was During the royal tour, when the Queen first visited Australia, in fact, the first monarch to visit Australia in 1954, she was actually able to give royal assent in person for this act. Indeed. So the the act was passed through both Houses of Parliament in late 1953, and generally Australian acts submitted to the Governor-General for royal assent. However, the then Governor-General said he was reserving this for royal assent, knowing that the Queen was on her way to Australia and she did so give assent and it's one of the few Australian acts that the Queen has personally assented to. Can you tell me since 1954 what's been the the reception of the flag throughout Australia, say in, in the 60s and 70s? I know as we come into the 80s it becomes contested with the Prime Ministership of Bob Hawke and Paul Keating. But in those post-Flags Act years, did you see a greater adoption of the flag through private buildings and community organisations? More official buildings and commercial establishments. In fact, one of the other things in the lead-up to the Flags Act for the Golden Jubilee of Federation in 1951, Menzies arranged to present a flag to every school in Australia And so it was flown probably more by officialdom and used to see the contrast in America where flags were flown by so many private citizens. Yes. That became more of a custom in Australia for some individuals and some companies to fly the Australian flag. Obviously, the practice varies. But as I guess you see the development in Australia of a push towards the Republic in the 70s and 80s, and then of course coming to a head in the 90s, you see the debate over changing the flag rise up and it becomes pretty prominent, that debate. And of course you have the Aboriginal flag being produced and becoming more widely adopted and disseminated and then the Torres Strait Islander flag as well. And they're sort of contesting ideas of national symbols, aren't they? Yes, probably during the Prime Ministership of Paul Keating, who criticised the flag, there was a period when there was a debate about the flag. I'd have to say that of all the multiplicity of opinion polls that have been taken about the Australian flag, there's only one, I think, that has ever shown a majority in favour of changing it. And you'd have to say that looks a bit of an outlier, given that today the Australian flag seems to be more popular, according to the opinion polls, than it's ever been. The reason I say that result was an outlier is because even though it showed a majority support for the proposition of changing the Australian flag, the next question asked was, should the Union Jack be part of the Australian flag? And the majority said yes. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. Yeah. So it is. most people focus on the first question saying, oh, this poll shows that the majority of Australians didn't want it to change, but they don't look at the second question. They want to change it, but retain the Union Jack. So I think that poll, as I say, is a bit of an outlier. And today, from what we can see from opinion poll evidence, the flag is more popular than it's ever been. So I was interested to note that in July 1982 at the Australian Labor Party's National Conference, the party actually changed its policy platform in regard to national symbols to initiate and support moves to establish with popular acceptance an Australian flag which will more distinctively reflect our national independence and identity. So as far back as 1982, you've got ALP policy saying we need to reconsider the flag. And, and of course, the argument against the current flag, as it still stands, is that it's not distinctive because it has the national flag of another country on it and then doesn't connote Australia, therefore, as an independent nation. And then there are the sensitivities around it being a reminder, well, at least the Union Jack, 
for Aboriginal Australians of a period of history where they were dispossessed and that their presence in the country was overlooked, they were silenced. So they're the criticisms that were coming to the fore in the 80s and 90s. Do you still see those concerns in your talks around the flag? Of course, through your organisation, you would have lots of debates about this with people with different opinions. Sometimes those are aired. We always take the view that the flag is meant to be an enduring symbol of the nation. And obviously, nations change over time. But if you change the flag every time the nation changed, you'd be running a new ensign up the flagpole every five minutes. Um, (laughs) And our flag acknowledges our history. We can't renounce our history. To tear down the flag because we're now an independent country rather than starting off as a colony, to tear down the flag to show that we're independent is sort of like someone who turns 21 burning their birth certificate to show that they're an adult when they turn 18 or whatever. You can't renounce your history. It is a fact. And European settlement came from Great Britain. It could have come from other powers. Flags acknowledge all sorts of history. The flag of Hawaii, a state flag of Hawaii, still includes the Union Jack because of its history. The fleur de lay of the French royal family, the white uh, colour, is meant to be represented within the tricolour of the current French Republican flag. And when you talk about recognition, the flag is designed for Australians. We Australians recognise our flag. It may be that others don't, but the flag was not designed for other people. It was designed for us. And I point out, for example, Indonesia, significant neighbour, most populous Muslim country on earth, its flag, does anybody know its design? Is red and white bars. You reverse it, you have the flag of Monaco. (laughs) So how many people recognise that national symbol of a very significant nation except its own citizens? So Australian flag is for Australians and it was adopted by Australians and we think it should remain that way. So Paul Keating was famously very in favour of changing the flag. So the Howe government selected in 1996, they agreed to hold a referendum on whether Australia should become a republic and that, of course, was held, as you very well know, in 1999. But in the lead-up to that in 98, the Howe government actually passes an amendment to the Flags Act, doesn't it? That's right. They said that Should there be an effort to change the current flag, it must have been put to the people first, so there's a popular vote, and that one of the options put to people must be retaining the current flag. And so that was a requirement put into the Flags Act of 1953. Around the same time, in 1996, the then Governor-General Sir William Dean officially proclaimed Australian National Flag Day for 3rd of September to acknowledge the day in 1901 on which the Australian flag was first flown. And when you mentioned that resolution from a Labor conference some time ago, I'm not sure if it's still in their platform. I'd have I to don't s- believe it is, actually, no. to be I, fair I'd, to the Labor Party. <laughs> I'd have to say that since Australian National Flag Day was proclaimed by the Governor-General in 1996, we've sought messages from prime ministers and opposition leaders in the intervening period. Every Labor leader since 1996 has given a message of acknowledging Australian National Flag Day, some in very warm terms. And the current Prime Minister, Mr Albanese, issued a very nice message last year for Australian National Flag Day. So I think that does show that perhaps the debate's moved on in terms of the political circles. Yes, and the fact that the Flag Day was announced in 96 and you had the amendment to the Flag Act in 98 requiring that if there was ever a change it be put to the Australian people, including the option to retain the current flag, that shows that that point in time these were hotly contested issues, but now it does seem in abeyance. Although, of course, when the new government was sworn in last year, the federal government, you did see three flags now being put behind the Prime Minister in official press conferences. You have, of course, the Australian flag, but the Aboriginal flag and the Torres Strait Islander flag. And then famously, shortly after the change of government, I think Adam Bant, the leader of the Federal Greens Party, took down the Australian flag when giving a press conference and only wanted the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flag. So flags are still potent symbols and being used by politicians and political leaders to make a point, aren't they? Yes, a couple of reactions to the points you made about the fact that 
Can I start with the Greens? We were, like many Australians, not only perplexed but also offended by the fact that somehow they thought they could unilaterally renounce the flag of the Commonwealth of Australia. They're entitled to their own personal opinion. However, they chose to stand for election as lawmakers. Their flag is, by law, the national flag of Australia. I think they have a duty to acknowledge it, and it is quite inappropriate for them to somehow airbrush it out of history and try and pretend that because of their personal whims, they can on behalf of 26 million Australians, change the flag because they think it's inappropriate. If they do want to change the flag, they should go out to the hustings, persuade Australians to vote in favour of a new flag rather than try and do it by subterfuge. Yeah, fair point, fair point. It was interesting, I guess, sort of in a continuation of the Howard government's attempts to really cement the position of the Australian flag in commemoration through the Flag Day and the flag's amendment bill. In 2005, the Howard government decided to financially support schools to erect or repair their own flagpoles to fly the Australian flag and that they actually tied education funding, didn't they, to the flying of an Australian flag for schools. So that was quite a strong policy around reinforcing the position of the flag in Australia as a national symbol. Has some echoes back to the Menzies Federation Jubilee of presenting flags to schools. I would just say that in terms of other flags of Australia, obviously there's only one Australian flag, the Australian national flag. There are other flags of Australia yes. and there's some confusion about that. In the case of the Aboriginal flag, as it's known, it was gazetted as the flag of the Aboriginal peoples of Australia. The Torres Strait Islander flag was gazetted under the Flags Act as a flag of Australia as being the flag of the Torres Strait Islander people of Australia. So we call them people's flags. Right. Other flags gazetted under the Flags Act have been, for example, the Royal Australian Naval Ensign, the Air Force Ensign, other special flags for particular purposes. So, as I say, there's a number... And the states have their own flags too, don't they? Not under the Commonwealth Flags Act, but yes. Yes. And so the flags protocol does say that there's a hierarchy of flags and obviously the Australian national flag has supremacy and then by custom and convention you can fly state flags if you wish and or other flags gazetted under the Flags Act which includes the Aboriginal flag and the Torres Strait Islander flag but they do not have the status as was pointed out by Mick Dodson at the time that they were gazetted of the Australian Aboriginal flag and the Torres Strait Islander flag they do not have the status of national flags and they're not seeking to supplant it. So, Alan, when were the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags first gazetted? They were gazetted in 1995 and the Aboriginal flag gazetted as the flag of the Aboriginal peoples of Australia and the Torres Strait Islander flag gazetted as the flag of the Torres Strait Islander people of Australia. Right, no, because they're people's flags. So you run the Australian Flag Association as national chair and as president of the Queensland branch. What are your principal activities and how long have you been in operation for? We're founded in the 80s and... Um, so when this was... When there was... Uh, quite a... A debate. Topical. And the thought matter. was that people didn't know much about the flag. They didn't know its story. We think it's a unique and inspiring thing that we had the world's first ever flag design competition. So basically we see our role as education, as providing information about the flag. We give a lot of advice about flag protocol. As I said, knowledge about the flag is very limited about its history, but also about the rules and the code of conduct for flying a flag. So from our website, we get queries not only from private individual and businesses, but also government departments and local councils who are saying... (laughs) What should we do? We've got this flagpole and we've got something happening, seeking advice. And so we always do as best we can, but obviously we're a voluntary organisation. We're not the official government. So yes, we provide information. We try and acknowledge celebration of the flag's birthday on Australian National Flag Day around the 3rd of September. And we do engage in talks at service clubs, schools, etc., that sort of thing. And our website, australianflag.net.au, does have a wealth of information and also sure source material about the flag. I have used it quite a bit in preparation for this podcast. It's fantastic. And you do provide a great resource because... 
you know, a lot of Australians aren't going to be very familiar with the protocols around putting up a flag, taking a flag down and, and how you should store it and the respect that should be accorded to a national flag. It's a symbol of the nation, so it needs to be treated with respect. And it used to be that that knowledge would be organically imparted, but it isn't widespread these days. So yes, we do have a job there. Alan, in your involvement in the Australian Flag Association, how have you seen the last year or so debate over the potential constitutional change to include a Indigenous Torres Strait Islander voice in the constitution? Have you seen that impact your work through the Flag Association? Not directly. We don't see that the flag has a bearing on that debate. As I say, according to the opinion polls, the flag is preferred by an overwhelming majority of Australians. We think that it is appropriate that the symbol of the nation endures whatever the changes to the constitution or the structure of government. Even if we became a republic, there's no necessary impact on the national symbol. For example, Canada changed their flag, but there's still a constitutional monarchy. So the two are not necessarily uh, linked. No, it's, it's curious, isn't it? It will be very interesting to see if the voice does get up later this year, whether there is a sort of renewed interest in the flag debate or not. But we know that you will be there advocating for preservation status quo and, of course, celebration of Flag Day on the 3rd of September. So thank you very much, Alan Pigeon, for joining me on Afternoon Live. Thank you, Georgina. That's it for this week's episode of Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute. Please make sure to subscribe and catch up on our latest online content on our website or on Twitter, LinkedIn or Facebook. 